He found this German engineer, and then he was in for a surprise. It turned out that BP Reiko was an ardent Nazi. The year was 1938, Europe was about to fall into war, and Schultes found himself drifting to the small Mazatec village of Wautla with an ardent Nazi as a companion. He also discovered that he had to learn better Spanish. He turned to a little Mazatec woman and trying to make polite conversation, said, ¿Cuántos años tiene? <laughs> and she said, solo mete uno. <laughs> As if he might have more than one. <laughs> then to make it even more interesting, there was another team of scholars led by Bernard Bevan, whose brother was in Churchill's cabinet. This was British Secret Service, also looking for the identity of this curious plant. They converged in a scenario right out of Indiana Jones on the village of Wauwa. Schultes found the mushrooms and then wrote an obscure scientific paper that was not picked up until Gordon Wasson, a banker in the 1950s, began to investigate this curious plant called Kalanakako. It turned out to be a mushroom. Wasson became the first outsider in history to take the mushroom in sacred context. He wrote an article for a magazine, Life Magazine, an editor picked a snappy title, Seeking the Magic Mushroom. The name stuck because Timothy Leary had a subscription to Life Magazine and the psychedelic gold rush was on. But Schultes, by this point, of course, has long disappeared in the place that had transformed his heart, Colombia. He arrived at Bogota in the fall of 1941, at a time when the church on the Santander Park was the biggest, tallest building in the city. He jumped on a trolley that took him past an ammunition plant. He followed some nuns up Montserrat and discovered in his first botanical collection, the first of over 30,000 he would make in Colombia, a new species of orchid. He then began a series of extraordinary expeditions traveling across the Paramos with Jose Cuatro Casas to explore the Paramos of San Ander, and then moving south into the homeland of the Kamsa. In the Valley of Sibandoy, in his first month in the field, he discovered four new species of hallucinogenic plants. He found this curious arborescent form of Datura, which he called the, the uh, Mephiscodendrum amnesium. It seemed to be a new genus. He found a valley that had 1,600 hallucinogenic trees. He worked with legendary curanderos like Salvador Chindoy. And this was his new discovery, but it was just one of five new species he discovered. And then he moved from Alto Putumayo down to the homeland of the Ingano. And every morning, the Ingano take a bejuco and rasp it and make a decoction, which they call yoko. You take the calabash, and as Carlos knows very well, within 10 minutes, your fingertips and toes begin to tingle. Schultes guessed that it had caffeine in it. And when he analyzed it, it turned out to be a new species. It turned out it did have caffeine, quite a lot of caffeine. In fact, in taking a calabash of yoko, the indigenous people were taking about 25 cups of coffee. They were not a people to do things in half measures. He then began to move down. His assignment was to find the botanical sources of the flying dead. Karari had yielded Di Tubo Karari at McGill University in 1943. Amazingly, even though this muscle relaxant had revolutionized surgery, the botanical sources remained unknown. We now know there are over 90 different species that yield um, these curious arrow poisons. But Schulte's first job out of graduate school was to travel to the northwest Amazon and seek the identity of a plant the Indians called the Flying Death. He went to the homeland of the Kofan. And you can see very dramatically in this photograph the effect that that Rolleiflex camera had the monumentality achieved in the image. The Kofan were the great manipulators of biodynamic plants. The entire topic 
was an attempt to mimic the costume of the being seen in the Yahweh visions when under shamanic influence. You could be, be uh, Kofan had an ability to manipulate plants that was almost second to none. We now know, for example, uh, from recent studies in Ecuador, that admixture plants for the Kravaris were traded hundreds and hundreds of kilometers across the northwest Amazon. And Schultes, for him to be with the Kofan with his first experience, was extraordinary. And then, following this, discovering ichthyotoxins, these curious barbascos, the yoko, the various different psychoactive plants, the incredible flying death, Schultes then left the Kofan and began the first of many epic journeys, traveling down the Putumayo, literally in the shadow of the Casalamas. He went up to Igaraparana, he went to El Encanto, La Chovera, and he was drifting through a world darkly, a world that had been dominated by a single planet. And Schultes was in Mokoa in 1941 when his life changed. The plant in question, of course, was caucho, the weeping tree, the white blood of the Amazon. And for generations, people had developed a fledging industry uh, in the Brazilian Amazon in particular. But all of these products had a critical flaw. A rubber cape in hot weather became a sticky shroud. A pair of rubber shoes in cold weather cracked like porcelain. And it was only the accidental discovery of vulcanization in uh, the mid-19th century by Charles Goodyear that transformed rubber from a curiosity to a vital component of the industrial age. And when that happened, the horrors that were unleashed throughout the basin were truly extraordinary. In 1888, an Irish veterinarian invented the rubber tire so his son could win a tricycle race in Belfast. Seven years later in France, the Michelin brothers invented the automobile tire. In 1898, there were 50 American automobile manufacturers. Oldsmobile, the largest, made 425 cars. Within 15 years, Henry Ford would be making the first of 15 million Model A's and Model T's. All of them ran on rubber tires. There was no source but the Amazon. The flash of wealth was mesmerizing. Andrew Carnegie in Pittsburgh said, I should have chosen rubber. Men in Paris and London uh, flipped coins to decide whether to go after gold in the Klondike or black gold in the Amazon. Manaus, situated at the heart of the trade, had by 1907 the highest consumption of diamonds in the world. Women would send their laundry to Portugal to be cleansed because they disdained the murky waters of the Amazon, while their husbands would slake the thirst of their horses with chill buckets of French champagne. 